There are a whole bunch of things we can do in the criminal justice arena to try to shift the landscape here. The very first thing I would say is the End Racial Profiling Act. It's been pending in Congress without being enacted for over a decade, and nice. I have fought for that long to try to get it passed. Wow. It almost passed in 2001 with the support of the Bush administration before it wow. then fell off the congressional table after the 9-11 attacks never to be seen again. Right. Uh, I have a great story involving, uh, and this is the summer of 2010, Obama has now been in for about a year and a half. I have a meeting uh, with a coalition. We're, we're speaking to congressional leadership. The chair of the House Judiciary Committee, the you know, leader of the Black Caucus, says to us that they are waiting to introduce the bill because they were then waiting for the Obama administration's support. And when it takes uh, years to get the support from the first black president, whose signature achievement before coming to the White House was supporting a state racial profiling policy, uh, when it takes years to get that administration to endorse the federal equivalent, uh, while a Republican president had embraced it before, you know something is wrong. Uh, yeah. And so the End Racial Profiling Act would do a couple things. The first thing it would do is collect data about the impacts of police stops, uses of force, arresting decisions, uh, lethal uses of force. You know, at the moment, we literally have to l turn to a British newspaper to learn the statistics of how many Americans get killed by police here every year. And that's right. preposterous. There's no reason we should have to go to Britain to find out what our own public servants, supposedly, right, are, are, are doing in the conduct of their official duties. Yeah. So the collection of that information is critical. The other thing ERPA would do is give citizens, residents of any kind, whether citizens or not, a right of private action, which is to say the opportunity to go to court, and here's the key, based on a disparate impact standard. So I need to take 30 seconds to unpack the significance of that. <laughs> um, the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, very powerful lever to achieve justice. It's the basis for a whole range of things, everything from Brown versus Board um, to uh, you know uh, opportunities to, to compete on equal terms in, in the workplace. The, the historical strike against the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause came, I think it was 1978, was the Washington versus Davis decision, which basically held that in order to state a claim, a constitutional claim, under the Equal Protection Clause, a litigant has to not only show disparate impact, that is to say that there was a statistical harm, but then they also have to show discriminatory intent, which is impossible. You can't prove the intent of the government agent who is doing X, Y, or Z, right? right. Which is why that requirement is basically the, the hole into which most civil rights claims sink. The ERPA, the Unracial Profiling Act, would take it off the table so that disparate impact, the statistical proof of discrimination, which the law would require the state to collect and then make available, it would be enough to state a claim in court. So that would be very uh, powerful at the policy layer in moving departments. In terms of moving individual officers, I think one of the most important things we can do is create a national registry of killer cops. If you get nice. fired from a police department, you should not get hired by another one. The person who killed Tamir Rice, the 12-year-old in Cleveland who was gunned down in a park within seconds of cops showing up because he had a toy rifle, right. that police officer had been fired from another department before, and the chief of that department said, this man should never work for a police department again. And then he ends up on the Cleveland Police Department's force, and that, then there's a 12-year-old dead. Uh, you know, there's no reason that cops should be able to game jurisdictions against each other. If someone's, you know, not fit to be a police officer somewhere, they're probably not fit to be a police officer anywhere else. Um, those are just two of the many reforms. You know, a third one I'd throw out there is the legalization of cannabis at the federal level. Yeah. The prohibition is absolutely a pretext to use to criminalize not just the behavior of individuals and entire families, but entire communities. And as a lever for the failed and racist war on drugs, the prohibition of cannabis is a crucial leg to take out of the stool of the prison industrial complex. And it won't be enough to unwind it, but it will certainly do a lot, for instance, to diminish civil asset forfeitures, which are often justified on the basis of the drug war. If you legalize some of these underlying uh, offenses, then the law enforcement abuses that, that rely on those criminalizations uh, as a foundation, some of those start to get addressed too. So I think that through ending prohibition, we could deal with a whole bunch of things, not the least of which is, is, is many of the racial biases that pervade the criminal justice system at the moment. Do you realize how many jobs and how much revenue would be lost if you took away the criminalization of pot across the United States? 
only in law enforcement. Think about how many jobs would be created, green jobs would be created across the cannabis industry supply chain. Absolutely. Uh, that there's, a, there's a real contrast there between what kind of jobs do we want. Um, and, and I think this is a, a great policy to, to make them very clear. Uh, that's, that's beautiful. I love that. I think a third thing for me would be that the police no longer get to scrutinize their own departments. Citizens do that. Um, that's a big one. Independent review you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of independent review. In a lot of places, civilian review boards become ruses, you know, where they, they have theoretical responsibilities, but without the resources to conduct real investigations like subpoena power. Right. And, you know, independent authorities with investigating powers, I think, are, are really crucial. I'll be honest with you. This is a big reason why I want to serve in Congress, because you know, I've been arrested before asking questions that no member of Congress has either the independence or the acumen to raise. The opportunity to participate in oversight hearings as an interlocutor, to be able to ask, for instance, the attorney general questions under oath, that makes me salivate because <laughs> quite frankly, there's no way that any part of the current paradigm is defensible. And I think that, you know, with a, an assertive advocate in place to raise the questions that aren't currently being asked, I think there's a whole, there's a great many things that we could help become uh, available in federal policy. And I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of it.